The Calcedon Foundation presents Salvation and Godly Rule Written by R.J. Rushdoney Narrated by Nathan F. Conkey One, Salvation, Pagan and Christian The Greek word salvation, soteria, means deliverance, preservation, victory and health, and it refers to material and temporal deliverance, as well as personal, national, temporal and eternal triumph. The biblical doctrine of salvation is so clearly one of victory that it must be emphatically stated that salvation is not escape. Many pagan concepts of deliverance are really doctrines of escape. The Deus Ex Machina, literally the God from the machine idea, shows us clearly how, in the Greco-Roman world, problems were resolved into men's hopes and imagination. A God was introduced in the drama to provide a supernatural solution to a dramatic difficulty by intervening in the problem to separate the besieged person from his difficulties. A way of escape was provided. Thus, in Homer's Iliad, Book 3, when the angry husband Melanaeus meets Paris, the seducer of his wife Helen, in battle, all did not go well with Paris. At this point, quote, Aphrodite snatched up Paris very easily as a goddess may and hid him in thick darkness and set him down in his fragrant perfume chamber and herself went to summon Helen. End quote. The outcome is that Paris said, quote, Sweet desire taketh hold upon me. So saying, he led the way to the couch and the lady followed him. End quote. Paris thus was raptured out of a losing battle into the rapture of Helen's lap a good model of pagan salvation. Escapism has been a dominant note in virtually all non-biblical religions, and one may add, in most politics as well. Thus, in Buddhism, the four noble truths of Gautama Buddha were, one, all existence involves suffering, two, all suffering is caused by indulging in inherently insatiable desires, three, Therefore, all suffering will cease upon the suppressing of all desires. 4. While still living, every person should live moderately. No distinction was made between good and evil desires. Quote, all desires, end quote, were to be suppressed, and nirvana, the total obliteration of consciousness, desire, perception, feeling and emotion, is to be sought. Nirvana is a passionless peace which is beyond consciousness and beyond nothingness. Quote, the Buddhist monk aims at doing nothing at all and may well end in complete vacancy of mind and character. End quote. Commenting on a poem which sets forth the Buddhist monastic goal, Parker called it, quote, a poetic glorification of laziness. End quote. The escapism can be from man's inner problems and the inner tension created by sin and guilt. St. Paul's declaration that, quote, he is a Jew, that is, a covenant man, which is one inwardly, Romans 2.29, was countered by Muhammad, who asserted, quote, he is a Muslim, who is one outwardly. The essential duties, or, quote, five pillars of Islam, end quote, are pure externalism. 1. The regular repetition of the creed. 2. Repetition of prescribed prayers five times daily and at three stated times. 3. The duty of almsgiving. 4. Observance of the Feast of Ramadan, which called for strict fasting in daylight hours and eating and drinking during the rest of the day. And 5. Pilgrimage to Mecca. Blackman has called the Egyptian doctrine of conception of, quote, Posthumous happiness, end quote. This is an accurate description because the Egyptian conception is not one of salvation, but rather of an earned retirement or reward. The gods of paganism may be able in some myths to provide an escape, but they cannot provide victory or salvation because they do not have an absolute and sovereign control over all things. Thus, an Egyptian love spell from about 1100 BC indicates that the gods could be threatened by a lover if he did not get his desire. Quote, Hail to thee, O Re Hakarite, father of the gods. Hail to you, O ye seven Hathors, 
who are adorned with strings of red thread. Hail to you, the gods, lords of heaven and earth. Cause so-and-so, Femini, born of so-and-so, to come after me like an ox after grass, like a mother after her children, like a drover after his herd. If you do not make her come after me, I shall set fire to Bessarus city and burn up Osiris. End quote. How limited the Egyptian idea of the gods was appears also in The Book of the Dead, in which Osiris knew, declared, quote, I am he who cometh for advancing, whose name is unknown. I am yesterday. End quote. Osiris is thus the evolving force of yesterday, far from self-conscious enough to know his own name or nature. Osiris is thus as much a product as a producer and as much an effect as a cause. The problem confronting paganism is thus apparent. Only a fully self-conscious, self-existent, sovereign and creating God can save man because only he can fully control, govern and determine all things. Gods who are themselves determined cannot save man because they themselves are often in need of being saved. In the cyclical outlook of paganism, the gods themselves are born out of chaos and must ultimately return to chaos with all things else. Such gods cannot save man, for in their universe no salvation is possible. All they can offer is a limited degree of temporary escape a deus ex machina answer which briefly placed Paris in Helen's lap. Soon thereafter, Paris was wounded by a poisoned arrow and an imp Oenone, whom he had married as a youth and deserted for Helen, was the only one able to heal him. She refused and Paris died. Only in scripture do we meet the God who is able to save. Genesis 1.1 declares, quote, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, End quote. As the only creator and absolute sovereign over all things, God is able to determine all things, and he does, and only he has the power to save man in the full and true sense of the word. Where the doctrine of creation is weakened, the doctrine of salvation is also weakened. As a result, in paganism, the quest is less for salvation than for escape, or, as in Hinduism, for mukti, or release. For the Hindu, release means, quote, emancipation from bondage to matter with all that this involves of pain and penalty, and entrance into a haven of rest and peace forever untroubled by the afflictions and sorrows that attend upon all earthly conditions. End quote. The ancient Iranian religion of Mazdaism could offer no salvation because it held to an ultimate dualism, the equal ultimacy of the good God and the bad God. Ahura Mazda could not save man. He himself was involved in continual battle with Angra Mainu, the spirit of evil. Man had to work his own deliverance. As Casartelli noted, quote, The Mazdaian doctrine is that each man works out his own salvation, though under the guidance of divine revelation and with the powerful spiritual aid of Ahura Mazda, his hierarchy of spirits and the teachings and examples of Zarathustra and his followers. End quote. A world, however, in which a man must save himself because the gods cannot do so, is also a world in which his own works can be reduced to meaninglessness by a turning of history. Pessimism and disintegration thus haunt all doctrines of self-salvation. It is thus wrong to speak of pagan doctrines of salvation. Salvation is a biblical concept. The word for salvation, Naja, is only used once in the Quran. Quote, the idea which the term Naja conveys to the Muslim mind is that of escape from future punishment in hell. Kalas, which means, quote, deliverance, end quote, is also used in the same sense. Thus, it is not so much escape from the power of sin in this life as an escape from the punishment hereafter that is implied in the term salvation, end quote. Thus, the Islamic conception of salvation, quote, is entirely legalistic. It is not a moral change in the heart now, leading a man to have power over sin to repress it, but a release in the next world from the punishment of hell in virtue of certain good acts done in this life. 
end quote. What constitutes these good acts we have already seen in our discussion of the, quote, five pillars of Islam, end quote. Among the Teutonic pagans, salvation was essentially an escape from external evil powers. It meant victory over evil forces, but this victory was an external battle, not a change in man's relationship to God. To the ancient Teutons, the idea of salvation applied in the first place to getting rid of those things which, to him, were absolutely evil. It also meant preservation from such destruction, danger and calamity as they expected to meet. Salvation thus meant delivery from evil spirits and from anything which they might bring about. Of evil spirits, there were a great number and many kinds, such as dwarves, giants, dragons and kobolds. Then there were the witches and wizards, the sorcerers and the enchanters, with all their arts and incantations used for the destruction of man. These pagan concepts thus cannot offer salvation, not only because they have no God nor universe in which full and assured victory is possible, but also because they have a defective view of man and sin. In paganism, man seeks an escape from his problems, or a retirement into sensual bliss from the world's work and responsibility. By failing to recognise his rebellion against the sovereign God as his essential problem as well as his sin, pagan man wants not salvation, but escape. To admit the real problem, his sin, is to admit that there is no way of escape, only the way of salvation through God's regenerating grace. Moreover, the failure of paganism to offer salvation is not accidental. It is a part of the pagan refusal to understand. It is a willful rejection of the truth of God. Lenski has translated Romans 1.18 thus, quote, For there is revealed God's wrath from heaven upon all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what is known regarding God is manifest in them, for God manifested it to them. For the things unseen regarding him, by being perceived from the world's creation on by means of the things made, are fully seen, both his everlasting power and divinity, so that they are without excuse. End quote. The sinner suppresses, holds down the truth of God because of his unrighteousness. Instead of salvation, he seeks escape or retirement. At best, he calls it a problem to be solved, which he insists that he is capable of solving. The problem is disguised in order to avert the answer. Thus, the requirement laid upon Christian apologetics is not only to set forth the doctrine of salvation, but also to so divine it as to eliminate the pagan concepts which masquerade as salvation. This the apostles did as they confronted the world of their day. Ramsey pointed out some years ago how common references to salvation were on Greek tombstones of the era. Quote, it is remarkable that the idea of quote-unquote salvation should be so closely connected with the making of the grave. Respect to the dead is a prayer for the whole family and its permanence and prosperity. The dead is gone to be a god with the gods, the tomb is his temple, and the worship of this new god is inaugurated with the grave and epitaph, which are the discharge of a vow to secure his blessing for the entire household. End quote. Moreover, quote, to the pagans, salvation was safety, health, prosperity, end quote. The word, quote unquote, salvation was important to the mystery religions, but it did not involve the idea of moral renewal, although the hunger for fullness of life was there. Quote, in paganism, the association of their salvation with the idea of rebirth or of death and a future life was invariable, end quote. The means to this end were pathetic ones. Quote, Among the pagans then, the term quote-unquote salvation was largely material in its connotation and salvation was gained by ritual and ceremony. There were three chief departments, so to say, of salvation among the pagans. The salvation gained by religious duties and vows and prayers, the salvation sought by magic rites, and the imperial salvation. 
As in every other department of life, so here, the policy of the empire enters to dominate and to guide the thoughts and acts, and even the prayers and wishes of all its subjects. End quote. Salvation was personal in the mystery religions, but in every cult, the basic background of salvation was political. Religion in paganism was subordinate to and an aspect of political order. As a result, the supervision of the state was held to be necessary and inescapable, and to deny this necessary supervision and recognition by the state, as the Christians did, was treason. Imperial salvation meant cradle to grave security on the imperial estates, and men regarded this loss of freedom in exchange for security as quote-unquote salvation. Serfdom in its origins was this imperial salvation of Rome. As Ramsey summarised it, quote, The salvation of Jesus and Paul was freedom. The salvation of the imperial system was serfdom. End quote. The early church refused to trust in man and in man's way for salvation. When persecuted for refusing to swear by the genius of the emperor, the Christians reminded the Romans that they took seriously such verses as 1 Timothy 2.2, 2, the command to pray, quote, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. End quote. As Tertullian wrote, quote, 32. There is also another and a greater necessity for our offering prayer in behalf of the emperors, nay, for the complete stability of the empire, and for Roman interests in general. For we know that a mighty shock impending over the whole earth. In fact, the very end of all things threatening dreadful woes is only retarded by the continued existence of the Roman Empire. We have no desire then to be overtaken by those dire events, and in praying that their coming may be delayed, we are lending our aid to Rome's duration. More than this, though we decline to swear by the genii of the Caesars, we swear by their safety, which is worth far more than all your genii. Are you ignorant that these genii are called daemones, and thence the diminutive name daemonia is applied to them? We respect in the emperor the ordinance of God who has set them over the nations. We know that there is that in them which God has willed, and to what God has willed we desire all safety. And we count an oath by it, a great oath, and as for demons, that is, your genii, we have been in the habit of exercising them, not swearing by them, and thereby conferring on them divine honour. 33. But why dwell longer on the reverence and sacred respect of Christians to the emperor, whom we cannot but look up as called by our Lord to his office? So that, on valid grounds, I might say Caesar is more ours than yours, for our God has appointed him. Therefore, as having this propriety in him, I do more than you for his welfare, not merely because I ask it of him who can give it, or because I ask it as one who deserves to get it, but also because, in keeping the majesty of Caesar within due limits, and putting it under the Most High, and making it less than divine, I commend him the more to the favour of deity, to whom I make him alone inferior." but I place him in subjection to one I regard as more glorious than himself. Never will I call the emperor God, and that either because it is not in me to be guilty of falsehood, or that I dare not turn him into ridicule, or that not even himself will desire to have that high name applied to him. If he is but a man, it is his interest as man to give God his higher place. Let him think it enough to bear the name of emperor, that, too, is a great name of God's giving. To call him God is to rob him of his title. If he is not a man, emperor he cannot be. Even when, amid the honours of a triumph, he sits on that lofty chariot, he is reminded that he is only human. A voice at his back keeps whispering in his ear, Look behind thee, remember thou art but a man. And it only adds to his greatness that he needs such a reminiscence, lest he should think himself divine. End quote. Tertullian's comments are of great interest on several counts. 
First, it is clear that 2 Thessalonians 2, 2 2-6 was interpreted by the early church to mean that the Roman Empire was the hindering power against the man of sin and his lawlessness, anarchic sway. Thus, however great the persecution of Rome, Rome was to be preferred to this alternative. Second, the trust of Christians could never be in the emperor's genius, in the emperor as a divine leader, but only as a man ruling over men under God. Third, salvation thus is not political and is entirely supernatural. As a result, the Christian's hope is not in imperial salvation, but in Christ's salvation. Not in salvation as security under an emperor's cradle to grave care, but in Christ's redemption from the power of sin and death. The redeemed man is renewed in Christ and made a new force in history, so that Christ, working in his saints, is actively recapturing and restoring all men and nations to his kingdom. As we have seen, the pagan concept of salvation, if the word can be so used, was essentially escapism, a retirement from life, or a search for security. These limited hopes reflected the essential pessimism of paganism. St. Paul cited an ancient pagan proverb expressing this cynicism, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. 1 Corinthians 15.32 Isaiah had cited this centuries before. 22.13, compare 56.12 The constant refrain of pagan wisdom was the misery of man. Hence, the sensible course for many was to grasp at the pleasures at hand, because death and the end of all things may come tomorrow. As against this, the biblical emphasis is on joy, on what Ramsey termed, quote, the happy lot of man, end quote. St. Paul spoke of, quote, the unsearchable riches of Christ, Ephesians 3, 8, and declared of the believer's future that God, quote, has raised us up together with Christ and made us sit together in heavenly places in Jesus Christ, that in ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, 6 and 7 In the face of all present problems, St. Paul's happy word is, quote, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Philippians 4, 4 The joyful prospect proclaimed by St. Paul is summarised by Ramsey, quote, not merely do we receive from Christ, we are the riches of Christ. To that great honour have we been exalted by the grace of God. The assembly of the saints, the whole body of Christians, the universal and Catholic Church constitutes the inheritance of Christ. The purpose of God from the creation has been to create and complete this structure as the kingdom of God, quote, the wealth of the glory of Christ's inheritance among the saints, End quote. Men who have the assurance of salvation are confident and triumphant men. When St. Paul declared, quote, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, Romans 1.16, he meant that, because salvation is entirely the work of the sovereign and omnipotent God, the proclamation of that good news could cause him neither shame nor embarrassment, his gospel was not the uncertain and possible work of an impotent or struggling God, but the absolute and certain work of the eternal, triune and omnipotent maker of heaven and earth. To preach such a certainty would bring Paul no shame or embarrassment. God's saving power is sure, 